All right. Should we start? Yes. Awesome. So someone in the room who has not uh, seen the, the other talk five minutes ago? Okay, so now you already have an idea what Fabric Private Chain Code is. That's great. Okay, let's now talk about the demo of Fabric Private C uh, Chain Code and see it in action. <clears throat> so, as, as we already learned, so what, what is Fabric Private Chain Code? Fabric Private Chain Code basically takes Fabric and extends it with the capabilities what, which we get from trusted execution environments. In particular, when we run our chain code now in a trusted execution environment, we get uh, the confidentiality of it, we get um, and the verifiability aspect of it, and we can also um, verify that everything was executed inside such a GT using this attestation we just discussed before. Let's talk about a use case where we believe Fabric Private Chain Code makes sense. And one of those use cases is a sealed bit auction. And this kind of auction is uh, often used for um, um, when 5G mobile licenses, for instance, are, sell to, um, are sold to telecom providers. Um, you can think about that um, in, in this kind of auction, I mean, um, <clears throat> Mick already told you that this involves really billions of dollars. So, and in particular, when we think about it, so why would we run such a system on a blockchain? It's, it's really obvious. So we really, in this use case, we really like the transparency aspect of a blockchain. So that means we can send our transactions to the network and when we evaluate the auction, everyone can see, okay, my bid has really considered in the evaluation. But the confidentiality, as, uh, confidentiality aspect that our bids should remain secret until we do that evaluation, we can get this from Fabric Private Chain Code. So in our demo, we are talking about such a use case where a government or a government organization wants to sell spectrum licenses for uh, mobile communication. So we can imagine that we have a um, deployment where we have a, a fabric network with a bunch of telecom providers, a telecom, BNet, and C-Mobile, and an auctioneer, which can be the government. <clears throat> so how is this then implemented? <clears throat> so we implement the logic of our auction as a chain code and run it inside uh, a TE. So, and the auction logic basically uh, gives us all the, the tools the auctioneer needs to um, run such a, such a complex auction. So those auctions are normally conducted into multiple rounds. So the auctioneer still has to do um, things like start a round, close a round, um, and in the end, uh, it has to trigger that um, the auction is evaluated. But on the other hand, um, the, the participants of the auction, so A Telecom, Bnet, and C-Mobile, they prepare their bids in a way that it can only be decrypted and processed by the chain code inside of the enclave. <coughs> and this looks like that. So people, um, the participants, they submit their transactions, to, to the chain code, it's executed. All the transactions, all the bits, they appear on the blockchain encrypted in a way that only the chain code itself can decrypt it. And then in the end, um, once the auction has triggered the evaluation, the result is published uh, in clear, okay? So let's have a, a look at the auction in action. Bruno. All right, so to see the auction in action, let's first put here our um, tab of the ledger. This is the ledger view. Okay, so all the participants basically, uh, the auctioneer and all the mobile operators will see um, 
will have access basically to, uh, to this view and to whatever happens on the ledger. That's the world state available to everybody. And as you can see here, there are already some transactions because we uh, initialized the chain code and for convenience, we also created, created an auction. Now, in these other tabs here, what we are going to do, we are going to um, play two different roles. Uh, we are going to play the role of the auctioneer here and then of a, um, of a bidder, basically. So we, we again, that's the auctioneer. And uh, <clears throat> we can see here that the auctioneer has already um, created the auction, sending all the uh, critical information inside uh, um, uh, in the, on, to the chain code inside an SGX enclave. And as you can see here, there are um, the set of participants, the bidders that are allowed to um, submit bids to participate in this auction, and uh, together with a set of items that are, um, uh, that are being auctioned. So these are... Uh, channels or licenses uh, in different uh, territories, uh, and you can see the opening bidding price um, and this sort of information. So what happens now, um, the auctioneer uh, decides to, um, after creating the auction, says, okay, time to really run the auction uh, and uh, um, let the bidders uh, bid something on those items. So. As you can see, the transactions start popping up with, uh, um, from different bidders, um, BNET, and then the auctioneer that performs some operations like uh, closing a round and perhaps starting another one if it's the, if it's the case uh, for, uh, for this specific auction uh, until the termination condition um, is, um, has been reached. Now, one thing to, um, to note before uh, placing a bid, uh, is that in these two tabs here, for example, um, so we made this for convenience, but in the end, um, the mobile operator and uh, um, the auctioneer will have different views and uh, um, different privileges in executing some action of, um, related to this auction. In particular here, C-Mobile has um, a view of the um, auction information, but cannot, for instance, start or terminate round, because those are um, uh, commands um, that only the auctioneer can, um, can raise. Uh, and we can see, we can see those, um, uh, the possibility of starting these operations uh, here. Now, in order to perform this, we need authentication mechanisms that we can, uh, um, we can leverage uh, thanks to Fabric that provides us some um, mechanisms to uh, authenticate who is performing the transaction. But inside FPC, then we need to make sure that um, it's indeed the auctioneer, the, the one that wanted to, uh, to start a round, and not, for instance, uh, another participant of the channel, perhaps an, uh, um, telecom operator, uh, for which this kind of operation must be forbidden. So now let's go to the <coughs> bidder view and um, let's place a bid. Um, so what happens here is that there have already been um, three rounds and in this case what we uh, want to do, uh, we want to um, reduce the quantity of, uh, um, for example, of um, licenses that C-Mobile wants to acquire in a specific territory because it says, okay, we got to the third round, it's, uh, um, the bid price is too high for us, so we're not going to uh, go ahead with this, um, uh, with this quantity here. So let's submit a bid. Uh, and uh, what happens here is that the FPC client chain code takes care of um, encrypted this auction directly to the chain code inside, um, inside the enclave, and only the chain code is able then to, uh, to decrypt and store the auction in order to be later processed. So the, uh, the bid arrived um, in, at the chain code and um, also into the uh, fabric blockchain. Um, after this auction, the, uh, the, the bid, the auction continues uh, with other bids, uh, bidders submitting the transactions, 
And the interesting thing here is that uh, even us here cannot see the content of these transactions because FPC keeps them, um, keeps those confidential. Um, and uh, I want to give you um, a brief uh, overview of what's stored in the ledger directly. And here, as you can see, there are a few, so these are key value pairs. This is what's stored on, in the world state, essentially. Uh, and uh, um, you can tell that there are some keys that you can recognize, uh, auction static state, uh, um, dynamic state, and so on. But all of these are encrypted values. So we cannot see them. We cannot see these values, uh, whether we are the auctioneer or we are uh, um, a different participant. Um, okay, now the auctioneer, since all the bids have been uh, placed, the auctioneer says, okay, it's time to um, terminate the auction and uh, go ahead with the evaluation of, uh, of the winner. So let's run uh, another transaction to uh, terminate the auction and uh, eventually evaluate who the winner is. Now, this is all done inside the, um, um, uh, by the chain code, and then um, given back as a result to uh, the auctioneer and, uh, um, and also the participant. In addition, in addition, we, we decided to implement also another transaction to uh, publish the results on the ledger, uh, and uh, in this case, what happens here is that um, this, there is a new transaction to publish results. Even in this case, these transactions, like all the others, have an enclave attestation here that allows all the participants to verify that the transaction is indeed um, a correct one that comes from the right chain code, from a genuine, um, uh, genuine uh, SGX enclave in this case. Uh, differently from the others here, uh, it's a bit subtle, but you can see that all the transactions have a lock here, meaning that the data is encrypted, but the published results here is not encrypted data. And in fact, if we look at what's stored on the ledger in raw data, we can see that there is all the previous state, which is immutable. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, it's a ledger, it's supposed to be immutable. Uh, and uh, uh, here, we have a published result key with, a, um, with some data in clear text, and you can, well, basically it's human readable, so um, this is what it's supposed to do. Um, okay, so the demo terminates here, and I want to go briefly back to the presentation to uh, simply recap what you get from uh, fabric prior chain code. So this is an extension of um, Hyperledger Fabric to bring data confidentiality uh, at the peers. From, so you can get data confidentiality from the, um, that is not visible to the peers and not even to the organizations that run those peers, essentially. You get this with the combination uh, of Fabric and a trusted execution environment. Still, uh, although the data is confidential, all the parties are able to verify that the operations were performed as they were um, intended to. So you get the operational transparency that Fabric provides, but still confidentiality and very viability by, um, by Fabric private chain code. And uh, the demo and all the code is on GitHub, and I guess Marcus would like to add something else about that. All right. Um Okay. Um, yes. Thank you very much, Bruno, for showing us this demo. I mean, um, I, for us, this demo really makes sense. I mean, this really shows the benefits of Fabric Private Chain Code, so we can process data uh, securely and only reveal the data which are necessary for the use case. Um, we learned a lot about spectrum auctions. I mean, more than I thought we would we have to in order to implement that. But for us, this is just a toy use case. However, there are people out there um, where, who, 
having a real use case with real security concerns. And we would really um, like to learn more about your use cases when you have uh, concerns about confidentiality. And maybe Fabric Pravichenko can help your, uh, with your use case. So we would like to invite you to check out the repository, approach us on, on all the channels. Um, so on, um, how's this? It's not called Slack. Damn. Rocket Chat, reach us on Rocket Chat. We have uh, weekly meetings where, uh, where we are open and I would like to welcome you to join. Um, if you have a use case for FPC, that's awesome. If you want to make this thing more robust, uh, help us to move from a prototype to a real fabric feature, we really appreciate your help. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, Yes. Um, so we definitely we have we as a hyperledger as a fabric private chain code um, hyperledger lab project we have the plan to be integrated into fabric. However, we cannot decide that the fabric community will decide that. Um, however, we did the first step, I think, two, last week or two weeks ago, that we uh, created an RFC proposing that um, as a feature for Fabric. And now we are in the state where we are collaborating with the community and, I mean, enhancing this uh, RFC um, and make it real for Fabric. So comments, suggestions, and feedback are welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So, um, um, I mean, when I said yes, uh, our architecture uh, involves that. However, the, the prototype looks slightly different here. Um, so the thing is that Fabric Private Chain Code, um, I mean, is, is, a, is a framework let the user build such systems. So that means that we provide the users uh, the opportunity to use different forms of encryption. So in, in that case, what, what we saw here, we had just have a single enclave um, performing all the transactions for us. However, in a, in a real environment when we have multiple enclaves, encryption is actually a tricky thing because we need some kind of deterministic encryption in order to pass the endorsement, policy, endorsement step, right? Because when many... Um, enclaves or TEs um, produce um, an output of a transaction, they should come to the same result. If that is encrypted, that, that's tricky. Right, so, so we have two things. I mean, so we have, so with Fabric Private Chain Code, it's possible to encrypt the read-write set. Okay, so this is one thing. But in addition to that, we also have a signature over the read-write set um, produced inside the enclave, which ensures us, or which demonstrates others, that this read-write set was actually produced inside of a trusted execution environment. So there we have two different things. So one is the encryption part, and one is the, uh, let's say, TE-based endorsement signature. And for, I mean, when we talk about the encryption, um, this really depends on the application, how the, the user actually wants to deploy FPC and what form of encryption um, has to be used there. If there are multiple enclaves uh, involved, then you need a shared key, ideally, um, which um, is distributed in, in a bootstrapping process, uh, which we haven't talked uh, in, in the sessions, but we, we have basically, we have a protocol for that um, to establish a shared key, which can then be used to encrypt um, the, the state, basically, the read-write sets, in a way that all the enclaves can later also decrypt the data. Right. So I mean, we have. So I think 
everything goes back to that queue which is implemented or which is rooted in the uh, CPU. But so this key is actually leveraged during this attestation process. But um, so on top of that, we have an, let's say, an FPC specific public private key pair when our chain code enclave boots up for the first time, um, then we perform the attestation with that enclave and the attestation basically binds our public key um, of that enclave to that attestation which we store in this enclave registry and then can be reused by others. So that means when we see on our ledger a transaction um, signed um, by the enclave, we can get the corresponding public key to verify that signature and then also go to the enclave registry to fetch the corresponding attestation report which is um, bind, bound to that public key and verify that this belongs to a proper um, FPC chain code. And then we can also check with this attestation, is this actually the chain code I assumed there? So that means that all the participants in that um, auction, they can verify that the correct auction chain code which everyone ha agreed on has been actually e executed. So briefly for the other people as well, uh, trust is rooted in hardware. The hardware attests the enclave, the chain code, and the keys of associated to this enclave. And from these keys, then we encrypt and sign other data. So there is a chain of trust here. Right, correct. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm also happy to discuss more details offline. Right. So, right. So, so what we, I mean, con, so, I mean, um, we conceptually store the ledger inside an enclave, but this is not how it's implemented. Because I mean, an enclave. So we cannot put entire ledger inside the enclave. I mean, if we think about Bitcoin, that doesn't fit. Okay. So, however, what what, what we store in our trusted ledger uh, trusted ledger enclave is only. Um, let's say, a concise view of that ledger. So basically, we store, we call this integrity metadata, which I agree can still be, I mean, if we have a, a, a large state, can also be large. However, um, using that data ceiling mechanism, we, there are also ways how to um, outsource this data securely on the untrusted host, store it on disk and load it on demand and verify that this data has not been tampered with. So we can basically, we can build the ledger enclave in a way that it, it can um, verify arbitrary large data and consume only the, the data which is needed for that verification. That operation of the disk would be outside the enclave? So it's outside the enclave, but whenever the enclave writes something to disk, the data is encrypted and authenticated. In, inside the enclave, and when it, it's loaded back into the enclave, it's verified, decrypted and verified. Okay, welcome. There was another question in the back. All right. Thank you again, That's and it. please Thank you. check out the report.